In book three, Aristotle turns from the subject of um, cultivating good character to the subject of allocating moral responsibility. How do we allocate moral responsibility and determine who is responsible for what and why? Okay, as he says here at the beginning, virtue or excellence is, as we have seen, concerned with emotions and actions. When these are voluntary, we receive, we receive praise and blame. When involuntary, we are pardoned and sometimes even pitied. It is generally recognized that actions done under constraint or due to ignorance are involuntary. An act is done under, under constraint when the initiative or source of motion comes from without. Okay, this is a very influential discussion in the history of criminal justice for determining moral responsibility. There are three kinds of actions that are canvassed by Aristotle in Book 3. Voluntary actions, involuntary actions, <laughs> and non-voluntary actions, or... Um, well, I should say, uh, best I will, will describe them as mixed actions. Voluntary actions are actions where the determining principle arises from within us. In other words, due to our wills. Aristotle is an advocate of free will. He thinks we have it. Uh, he thinks that we can actually determine our, our uh, behaviors and that we are not subject, you know, as powerless individuals to our circumstances, as I mentioned a minute ago. Involuntary behaviors can be due to two things, force or ignorance. Okay, and persons cannot be held culpable for uh, actions which are involuntary. Okay, um, pretty clearly, physical force uh, creates an involuntary behavior. Uh, if you are standing with your friend next to a railroad track and a train is coming and someone rides a motorcycle into you and you hit your friend and your friend falls on the tra railroad track, okay? Tragic circumstance. No culpability, not your fault, you were physically forced. Okay? Um, if you're standing on a railroad next to a railroad track with your friend and the train is coming and you know an evil thought comes into your mind, uh, she stole my boyfriend last month. Okay? And you give her a nudge. <laughs> okay, clearly voluntary. The source of the motion arose from within you, you are culpable. Okay. Involuntary can also, though, be due to ignorance. If you are not aware of certain pertinent circumstances that should have informed the action, then you are not culpable, with some caveats. Okay, so imagine, I don't know, uh, imagine you work for the king. You're the cupbearer for the king, right? And uh, you bring the wine goblet each night to the king at the head table and one night you bring it to the king and he takes a step dumps his chest says i've been poisoned falls over dead okay well your job was just to bring the wine goblet from the kitchen to the head table that's all you were supposed to do you had no idea what they were doing in the kitchen the wine. now maybe i guess you you're supposed to sip it first <laughs> <laughs> I saw this movie um, last year, I guess I saw. I had never seen this movie before. It's from the 90s called The Sum of All Fears. It's like a Clancy movie, Tom Clancy uh, movie. Anyway, this uh, dude had his um, liaison get in and start his car because, you know, he thought there would be a car bomb, right? This is a bad dude, right? No, no car bomb. So he says, cool, gets in, turns on the AC, and the car explodes. Because like they knew apparently he'd turn on the uh, the climate control, so you know terrorists are smart, man. Terrorists are smart. Okay, um, okay. So uh, then there are also mixed actions, and these are the really interesting actions from a moral perspective and from the perspective of uh, criminal justice, right? So um, these are actions that have both a voluntary and an involuntary character simultaneously. Uh, the, one of the examples Aristotle gives is of a ship's captain. Okay, the ship's captain is caught in a storm. He's got to throw the goods overboard in order to save the ship. Is this a voluntary decision? Yes. No. It's 
Simultaneously, he is being determined by the storm, and he is determining to throw the ship's goods overboard. Okay, um, we could imagine other kinds of mixed actions as well. Uh, yes, depending on the circumstance. So which one are you thinking of? What are you thinking of? Okay, right, right, right. So it depends. So um, recklessness and negligence are often mixed because uh, the individual in question didn't intend for the wrongdoing to take place, and yet appropriate, circum appropriate steps were not taken to prevent the wrongdoing. Um, Aristotle's got this interesting bit about... Uh, appropriately informing oneself about background knowledge with regard to one's actions. Okay, and this is really interesting. It's a really interesting discussion about mixed actions. He says, um, you need to, you have a duty to make yourself aware of the information that pertains to the actions that you are doing. And this duty is the standard that a reasonable person would employ. Okay, so um, you don't have to go to the ends of the earth to determine every last possible bit of information that pertains to the action that you are doing. However, you do need to perform some degree of due diligence to ascertain whether the action that you're performing is a moral one. Now, for most of us, routine actions every day, we already know all the background information that is pertinent to the action in question, so we don't really have to think about it. But sometimes when we find ourselves in circumstances where we are confused, there is incumbent upon us a duty to figure out precisely what is going on in these circumstances. And if we do not actually figure out what is going on in the circumstances, then we can be culpable, Aristotle thinks, because we did not appropriately inform ourselves about the background in the circumstances in question. Okay, so um, if you work for a company and you say are an accountant, but you're kind of a low level accountant and you happen to stumble across uh, books one day in the company and these books suggest fraudulent behavior occurring at the company, but you know, it might not be fraud and you hope it's not fraud. It just looks on the surface like fraud. And you think to yourself, I'm just going to let that one go. I'm not going to make any further inquiries. I will, you know, let those who want to deal with this deal with this. I don't want to know. Okay, you can be culpable, Aristotle thinks. Not as culpable as if you were actually doing the fraud, because that's a purely voluntary action. Okay, but you can be culpable to some extent in a mixed nature because you did not inform yourself appropriately of the background information about the action in question. Okay, there's another um, important caveat to mention when talking about Aristotle and mixed actions. Uh, Aristotle thinks that um, you can be culpable even in circumstances where you couldn't have done otherwise if prior to those circumstances you did have an opportunity to do otherwise. Okay, so um, at time T1, uh, Roger gets drunk at a party. At time T2, Roger climbs into his truck so drunk that he does not realize what he is doing. He is not at that point cognizant and aware. At time T3, Roger runs over pedestrian Jane. At this point in time, Roger may not be able to do otherwise. Okay, because he has lost his ability to control his actions voluntarily. And we can say, like, honestly, at this point in time, he couldn't control what he was doing. This is, at that point in time, at least it's an involuntary action. But he could control what he's doing here. And a T2, maybe, yeah. And thus, it can be held culpable to the same extent as if he had intentionally run over Jane, 
Probably not, but definitely to a strong degree. Tiffany. Uh, like a crimes of passion or something like that? Like wife finds out husband has been cheating on her, wife chases husband with the baseball bat and beats his brains in? Like that sort of thing? Okay, okay, sure. There was a case in Texas like that, not too long ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, no, 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 the, the dude sexually assaulted a guy's daughter and the guy killed him. Yeah, and the jury was lenient. It's like, yes. <laughs> Whoa, that's uh, that's pretty rough. He still wants jail. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> You're not talking about that. I'm talking about like if she's really angry, like you can't do that. <laughs> 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 Crimes of passion are never punished to the same extent in the criminal justice system as premeditated uh, crimes. They never are. Like if you mur- if you premeditate your murder and like plan it all out and kill someone, you will be punished more severely. It, it has always been this way and always will be. Then if you just like randomly like become very angry at someone and just murder them. Yeah, so we build these kinds of, this is a very influential discussion in Aristotle's text. We have built his caveats, et cetera, into our criminal justice system over the centuries. Um, so that you know we, we treat different kinds of actions differently based on the intentions of the agent. And if the agent has, you know, not informed himself adequately about background circumstances, maybe we say, well, you didn't actually do the deed, but you know, you should have you should have informed yourself about the fraudulent stuff and you were kind of an accomplice to what was going on because you didn't uh, turn them in when you should have or properly inquire, make further inquiries. Okay, or or we say, um, well, because you didn't uh, do appropriate, take appropriate caution at a prior time, uh, you can still be held criminally negligent or, or accountable. Okay, so we've built these kinds of things into the criminal uh, justice code over the centuries. Okay, questions or comments about that from book three? Moral responsibility. Okay, good. Yeah, you're, you're kind of raising a very different line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, man. Um, uh, Um, yeah, so like I said, uh, it's coming from Greek, right? And this is uh, a set of lecture notes. So it's not especially intelligible to begin with. It's not as though this is a a systematic treatise. Uh, So there's that. But then also, um, some translators go for strong rigor and literal translation. And others say, well, let's translate the most readable format possible so that people understand the spirit of the text. And so it can be really different. It's kind of like the difference between, um, so have you guys encountered the Message Bible? Right? Or or like the Cotton Patch version of the Bible? Or or sometimes the Living Bible? Or the, uh, uh, what's the the one that came out of that? There's like a really, like like a really, yeah, anyway, like it's basically a paraphrase. Yeah, these some of these are basically paraphrases. It's like, you know, that's not really what it says. Yeah, and then others are like so literal word for word that like the words are out of order in English because, you know, that's the way it's listed in the sentence in Greek. And so it's, you know, like that's a little too much. 